Peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the sixth season of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I want to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's Holy Word. And right now we want to get right into God's Word, so let's go. And now I would invite you to take out your Bibles, either the ones that you brought with you or the ones in the pews, and turn in them with me to the book of Luke, chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and we're going to be reading a couple of different passages, or a couple of different verses from this passage. Um, Skip a few in the middle. And it's found on page 61 of the New Testament, if you're following in the Pew Bible. We are beginning... A a new time on the church calendar. Advent is over. And so this week is Baptism of the Lord Sunday. It's a day when we mark the time when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Or John the Baptizer. The time between Advent and Lent is what we call ordinary time. And it's not ordinary as in it's common, boring, old church calendar time. It's ordinary as in it's ordinal time. It means that we count the weeks between Advent and uh, Lent. Now this week, Easter is on March 27th, so Lent comes very early for us. We only have five weeks in between Advent and Lent. And then uh, Ash Wednesday is February 10th already, just a month from today. Hard to believe. As a pastor, I freak out when I see things like that, but that's okay. Um, But five weeks is not a very long time to do sort of a sermon series. Luckily for you and for me, The United Methodist Church has put together a series that I'm going to be following along called First Things. We're going to look at, over the next five weeks, some of the first things that happen in the ministry of Christ. And today we're going to look at the first step. The first step in Christ's earthly ministry was for him to be baptized. That's why we celebrate the baptism of the Lord on this Sunday. So, it's also the first step for all of us as Christians in our Christian walk. It's the first step that we partake. It's the symbolic washing of our sins, but more than that, it's the symbolic receiving or the receiving of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let us hear the word of the Lord for us this morning, beginning at verse 15. We'll read verse 15 through 17, then 21 and 22. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire." whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, In thee I am well pleased. May God pour out his rich blessing upon this, the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. O Lord, we come before you this morning with fear and trembling. We have just completed the Advent season and already we are looking forward to Easter. Slow us down during this time and prepare our hearts and minds to receive your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Spirit that we may be your people and you may be our God. For we ask it in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The beginning 
of our Christian walk typically begins with baptism. In my life, I was baptized at the age of four months old. I don't remember it. But unmistakably, that was the point at which God entered into my life through the Holy Spirit and began to reshape me in His own image. You see, we read in Genesis that God created man and woman in His image. And any time we stray from that image of God, that's what we call sin. Baptism is a restoration. It washes away all that junk of the world and puts us in the hands of our God. And at that point, he begins to act. Now, baptism isn't the act that causes God to suddenly get off his throne and say, okay, now I'm going to start working in this person's life. But baptism is a recognition that we belong to God. It's a symbolic washing of our sins. It doesn't actually wash away our sins. And it's not the act of baptism that saves us. It's God's grace. But baptism is a symbol of that grace. When I was four months old, I was baptized at St. John's um, Methodist Church in Turnersville. And my mother grew up in First, United, or First Methodist Episcopal Church of Millville, First, First Methodist Church of Millville. And she uh, had a pastor there named Harold Gifford. And he was now the pastor at St. John's in Turnersville, and so she wanted him to perform the baptism. Again, I don't remember this. I just, I've seen pictures, and this is what my uh, mother told me. And I have a little record that says that I was baptized on that day. I was raised in the Methodist church. My mother took me to Sunday school, took me to church, took me to worship services. And so I understood a little bit about God, about Jesus Christ. Through the cycle of the church calendar, certainly we learn about things like the birth of Christ, the incarnation of God on earth. We learn about his crucifixion and his death and his resurrection. And we learn about his ministry, his teaching. We learn about the miracles that he performed. We learn about God's grace in so many different ways. And I learned about God's grace through the Pittman United Methodist Church growing up. But at the age of 16, I received on my heart a call to ministry, to pastoral ministry. And at that time, I said, no, I don't want to do that. That's, that's not part of my plan. I, I want to be a drummer in a, in a rock band. You know, I want, to, I want to play timpani for the Philadelphia Symphony. I want to be a musician, you know. And then I thought, this is not something that I want to do. I turned away from it. When I went into college, I suddenly was thrust into this big world that I was not prepared for. You know, I grew up in Pittman. Uh, Pittman is, by most accounts, a small town. I mean, it's a town of a little less than 10,000 people, which is huge compared to, you know, Oldman's Township. But um, it's... It's a predominantly white, predominantly Christian, predominantly Protestant Christian town. And so I wasn't exposed to a lot of things. I remember when I was in high school, I dated a girl who was Catholic, and that freaked me out, you know? I didn't, you know, what is this Catholicism thing? I don't get it. You know, she's Christian. Okay, I'll, that's good enough. But I didn't know anybody else, any other religions of that sort. I was never exposed to it. When I got to college, and I went to Rutgers in New Brunswick. Now, Rutgers alone, the, the student body of Rutgers in New Brunswick is about 45,000. 
okay? And it's a much more diverse population than, say, the town of Pittman. And there I met Muslims and Jews and uh, Hindus and Buddhists and this really radical group of people called atheists who didn't believe in God at all. And I wasn't prepared for it. Because growing up in my sheltered little town of Pittman, I just, I wasn't exposed to it and I, I didn't know how to, how to process it. And I started to think to myself, all these people and all their beliefs, they can't all be right. This is before postmodernism, which teaches us that there is no one absolute truth. But in my mind, I was saying they can't all be right. They have to, some of them, be wrong. How do I know that what I believe is right? And little by little, I started to lose my faith to the point where I decided that none of them were right. All of them were wrong. And that I didn't any longer believe in God. I lost my faith completely. I said, God is a nice little idea for people who need him. But I don't need him. I'm stronger than that. That's not true, but I mean, that's what I believed. Or that's what I said, anyway. During this time, I also fell into a a spiral of uh, depression, drugs and alcohol abuse. Um, I went into the military. I was married, had some children, cheated on my wife a lot. And it was not a very good time for me. And when I got out of the military and and I was struggling to take care of my family, I realized that I had a problem. And the problem was me. I started going to a 12-step program called Narcotics Anonymous, based on the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program. And there they teach total abstinence from drugs, but they also teach a reliance upon something called a higher power. And that kind of disturbed me because I was like, no, I I don't believe in God, so I don't don't know how I'm going to do this whole higher power thing. Well, somebody said to me, listen, we're a spiritual and not religious program. So... You can believe in whatever you want, but you need to believe in a higher power that can rescue you. I said, well, how do I do that? They said, well, if you don't believe in God, believe in the program, because the program works. And together, we can do something that you alone cannot do, and that is a power greater than you. Okay, I can hold on to that. I can start with that. I can build with that. But in the course of the first year of my recovery, I slowly began to realize that there was something more at work in my life. It wasn't just the group. It wasn't just my sponsor. It wasn't my family. It was this, quote-unquote, higher power that I slowly began to realize was God. God was still active and working in my life, even though I had turned my back on Him, even though I had denied Him. He was still working in my life and still bringing me to become more in His image day by day. So I started to believe again. I started to believe and I, and I, I put one foot in front of the other and I slowly began to have a relationship with God again. And it took a long time. It took me 14 years of recovery before I ever decided to even set foot in a church again. But when I did, there was no looking back. The first Sunday, God grabbed me and has not let go. And... I could think of no place that I'd rather be on a Sunday morning or really any time than here in in God's presence. Carry God with me all the time. At that time, when I started to 
come back into the church, I slowly began to remember and realize I had this calling. God actually reminded me. I've told this story many times. I was, I was, I was listening to um, Johnny Cash singing um, softly and tenderly, Jesus is Calling. And I, it was poor, I, I, tears were just pouring down my face. I'm driving to work on the Commodore Barry Bridge. And I imagine people were looking at me going, what is wrong with that guy, you know? But uh, I was right at the top of the bridge and I, I found myself praying and saying, God, whatever you want me to do, because you did this great thing for me, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And then God reminded me in that moment that my calling was to pastoral ministry. And at that time, I said, okay, okay. You held nothing back from me. I'll hold nothing back from you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Now, since that time, I've, I've gone back to school. Uh, I got my associate's degree at Gloucester County. I've been uh, at University of Southwest now getting my uh, degree in psychology. And... Then in 2013, I received another call from the district superintendent. And he invited me to be the pastor of this church and of Ebenezer. And so I said yes, because I stopped saying no. Uh, saying no just gets me into trouble. So, of course, saying yes gets me into trouble sometimes too. Especially, you know, at the country store when they have the chocolate chip cookies on the counter. And, and okay, this could pass that. Yeah, yeah. Don't I? She knows. <laughs> she knows. So, I look, at back, I look back at my life, and I think if any of us take a really hard look back on our lives that brought us to this moment where we are right now, we can see times when God was active in our lives, even if we didn't acknowledge it, even if we didn't recognize it. And it all begins with our baptism. And like I said, I'm not saying that baptism is some magical thing that calls God into our lives, but that is the moment when we are dedicated to God. Maybe we didn't make those vows ourselves, out of our own mouths. But God made a covenant with us in that moment, and He honors that covenant. Baptism isn't about what we do. It's about what God is doing in our lives. In the text that we read today, we see the baptism of Jesus. And you think, Jesus is God incarnate. He is God born as a man. Why in the world would he need to be baptized? John was preaching a baptism of repentance, turning away from sin. Jesus was a man who was tempted in every way that we were and yet knew not sin. What would he have to repent from? But baptism is the beginning point in his earthly ministry. And baptism is the point when we begin our walk with God. Do you know in the Bible there is not one miracle recorded that Jesus did that happened before his baptism? This was the first step. It was the first step in his earthly ministry. It was the first step in everything that he was going to do, in everything that was to come, in every miracle, every word that he taught, every thing that he did in life and in death on the cross began with the first step, baptism. He began his earthly ministry by being baptized in the Old Testament tradition. But his baptism was unlike any that had ever come before it. The Holy Spirit 
descended like a dove upon him bodily. And the skies opened up and God's voice said, This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Had never happened before. And I can just imagine that the people who were there were like, wow, what in the world just happened? This is incredible. So we ask ourselves today, what is baptism? It's a symbol. It's a symbol of being made clean, but the water only cleanses us from the outside. The Holy Spirit cleanses us from the inside. John said that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That fire is not a punishing fire, but a purifying fire. Gold is a rock. It needs to be melted down and then all the impurities scraped off the top until all you are left with is just pure gold. But it needs to be exposed to the fire to remove the impurities, to become refined and pure. And so, God's Holy Spirit in us sanctifies us. It's a fancy church word, which means that he makes us more like Christ every day. He makes us holy. And that's another fancy church word, which means that we are separate. We are separate from the rest of the world. God calls us to be something different than what the world calls us to be. You see, the world approves of many things that God does not approve of. Not only does the world approve of such things, but a lot of times those things are held up as virtues. We in the church have, by and large, we have lost sight of the message of holiness. We need to be reminded that we are called by God to be holy. We don't like to talk about holiness. We don't like to talk about sin. But the fact of the matter is, sin affects all of us, every single one of us, from the top down, the the most pure. I don't care who the person is. We're not Catholic, but certainly we, we, we look at the Pope as being a holy person. And as holy as he is, I guarantee you that there is something in his life that he struggles with. Because he's human. He's not perfect. Only one person ever in the history of the world was perfect, and that was Jesus Christ, who was God incarnate. I have my own struggles. You have your struggles. We all have struggles. But God is there with us in every step of the way. And he helps us. He purifies us. He sanctifies us. Baptism is a means of grace. John Wesley called it a means of grace. It's a a way that God enters into our lives. Just as through study of his holy word, through prayer, through personal acts of piety, through personal holiness, through uh, physical well-being. You know, John Wesley was very um, concerned about body, mind, and spirit. He was really ahead of his time. He was very concerned that Christians were healthy physically. That Health is also a means of grace. And through the sacraments of baptism and communion, we receive the grace of God. So, baptism is a sacrament. Sacrament's another fancy church word. To me, I I think of it as a sacred moment, a sacrament. It's a time when we recognize the presence of God and we are astutely aware. Just as Mary said in her prayer in the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. 
Suddenly our eyes are opened and we see just how big God really is. Today we remember our baptism and we reaffirm the covenant that we made with God through our baptismal vows. Some of us, myself included, had these vows made for us as children. But God makes his covenant with us in that moment. And his word is sure. He will not let us go or be taken from the palm of his hand. Sure, we may wander. We may drift away. We may backslide. But we are always his. Today, friends, I invite you to remember that you were baptized and rejoice. Let us pray. Lord God, your Holy Spirit descends upon us this day and every day. We remember today that we are baptized into your church, and we recall the times that you have been working in our lives to make us more in the image of Christ through your Holy Spirit. Wash us from within. Sanctify us by your Holy Spirit. Turn our hearts away from the world and back towards you. For we ask it in the name of Christ, our example and our friend. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Guerrilla Christianity. My hope and prayer is that this time of listening to and learning from God's Word has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. Now, I have been blessed that God has called me to minister to two churches in rural New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pettertown. And if you don't have a church family to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. We are a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring faith community in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. But if you don't live nearby, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So I would encourage you to live out your faith with a group of like-minded believers where you are. Again, I pray that you have been blessed by this teaching, and I hope that you will join us again next time. God bless you and keep you. Amen. Amen.